Welcome to John Gets Games. Today I'm going to do a post Board Game Geek Con wrap up of a whole bunch of different games that I played at the convention. I actually played 25 new games to me, and in this two part vlog, I'm going to be covering 20 of those games. So 10 in this one and 10 in the next one. I'll be going from the games I really liked to the games I did not like so much in each of these parts. So there's going to be good stuff and not so good stuff in both of these videos. So let's jump right into it. The first game I want to talk about is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. Uh, now, I've talked about this many times on my channel before, but at the convention, CGE was kind enough to actually give me a review copy of the brand new game. And it was about four hours later after getting this copy of the game that we couldn't help it. We sat down and we played a full game of it. Uh, I played this with two of my best friends. All of us are pretty experienced with Through the Ages. I played the original about 18 times, and both of my friends have played it about seven times. And uh, it's just so great. <laughs> we really, really enjoyed it. But that three-player game still took four hours. So even though we're all somewhat experienced with the game, it's still a pretty lengthy experience. Uh, if you've seen the review I did for the original game of Through the Ages, you'll know that it is one of my favorite games of all time, but with a pretty big asterisk that I did not like the crazy militarization at the end of the game. And I can happily say that instead of calling this game my favorite game, but I can now say this is my favorite game with a big exclamation point at the end. It is an exceptional new version. They've streamlined through tons of data usage and looking at uh, thousands of games to just make this great game exceptional. And uh, we really enjoyed playing it, and I'm really glad to have a beautiful copy of it here, and I look forward to playing this a couple times a year for pretty much ever. Game number two is actually one of the only two games I purchased at the convention. It's right up here, and it's called Royal Goods. Um, the, Royal Goods is the German name for it, even though it's in English. The uh, English printing that isn't out yet is going to be called Oh My Goods, and I talked about this in my uh, games I was excited to play at Board Game Geek Con, and I bought this in the first 10 minutes of being at the convention. I saw uh, Suzanne posted on Twitter that they were selling it in the uh, Board Game Geek store, and I just jumped right all over it. I ran over there, I bought a copy for 20 bucks, and I played it a couple times, and it is really great. It's this tiny little game, it's got just two decks of cards here, but it's got a very strong Euro feel to it with multi-use cards. It's kind of blown me away. It's just such a neat little package because you are building this engine, but the cool part is that you are building gears that then work with other gears. So you build um, one particular building and it might make you uh, bricks, so you turn clay into bricks. But then you build another building that needs bricks in order to make, I don't know, houses or something like that. So then you have to have this first piece before you can really make the second piece work better. Now you can always make every piece work without its um, other pieces, but getting the synergy going just really boost this awesome ow, combo synergy thing. It, it, the game really looks somewhat dull when you look at the uh, cartoony art of people like in the Middle Ages making stuff, but it's really fascinated me with the cool engine building, and I very much look forward to playing this one a bunch of times. It's pretty much multiplayer solitaire. In fact, I played uh, most of a game by myself a couple days ago just to see how it played by myself, and I still had a good time playing it. So I'm super glad I was able to pick up a copy of this one. The third game I want to talk about is also on my shelf, and I sort of bought it at the convention, and that is Seven Wonders Duel. Uh, now, this one sold out very quickly at Board Game Geek Con, and I did not get to get a copy of it, but I did play the Hot Games version of it a couple times, and while I was at the convention, I went online and I bought it from Amazon because I was so blown away by it that I just really wanted to have a copy, and I was worried that it was going to sell out because it seems like a lot of places are um, losing their inventory for it just because everybody's getting it. And essentially, I was super excited to play this game at Board Game Geek Con, and it, it did everything that I wanted it to. Uh, it has this great two-player feel where you are just struggling back and forth with this tug-of-war with military, and specifically, the biggest thing is replacing the hand drafting with pool drafting, where you're no longer looking at cards in your hand and picking one out and passing it to the person on your left. You're now just grabbing cards from an open pool on the board. Some of them are face down, and you don't want to unlock those for your opponent. And there's just all sorts of good stuff going on, but at the end of the day, it's a great tableau builder. You're making these great little engines. You get to draft the different wonders at the very beginning of the game in another pool-style draft. It just comes together very well, and it usually plays in about 30 to 40 minutes, so the box says 30 minutes, and I think that's very accurate. Uh, I've really enjoyed this one. In fact, I'm hoping to do a review for this one quite soon because I've already played it four times, and I've really enjoyed it all of those times. So uh, you'll be seeing more from me on this one shortly. The fourth game I want to talk about is Gold West. Now this was my number one most excited game to play at the convention, and I was able to get to it on my second or third day, and I really enjoyed it. It did 
pretty much everything that I was hoping for it to do. In this game, you are very simply doing things on your turn where you are putting down a hut to take a certain amount of resources, put them on a little Mancala track that uh, lets you pick up resources and drop certain ones down, and you get to make new buildings, and it's very simple. You are essentially just trying to mine copper, silver, and gold, and you ship them out, and you turn them into investment tracks, and it's a medium, light to medium weight Euro game, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, we played a four-player game. Everybody around the table liked it. I lost by like three points, and I really felt like I had a shot at it, uh, and that was with getting pretty much none of the investment cards. So it appears that there's several different ways that you can play the game, and I think that there's a definitely a deeper layer of strategy there that none of us really got into, because in the game, when you take resources, you put them onto a Moncala track, as I mentioned before, but the farther back you put it, so the farther away from being able to utilize the goods, the more points you get. And none of us really use that very much. We pretty much always put it right near the front so we could just cash out those goods on the next turn and do cool stuff. But once the game was over, we really, look, we really looked at it, and I feel like next time I play, I'm going to try to plan a little bit more ahead, be a little bit more strategic, and cash in on those big points that are near the bottom of that track and see how I do. So I really enjoyed this one. I will say that near the end of the game, it was a 10 round game because it was four players. Those last two turns got pretty slow because there is uh, quite a bit to think about because of there's area majority with respect to the four different regions that you can grab stuff from. And so those last two turns, there's a lot of thinking, well, what am I winning? What can I safely win throughout the rest of the game? What do I need to defend? And it seemed like analysis paralysis started creeping in there at the end, but I feel like multiple plays will reduce that. Also, potentially playing with three players instead of four will make it uh, have a little bit less to analyze when you're comparing opponents to each other, but I still really enjoy the four-player game, and I hope to have the opportunity to play this one several more times. I'm not sure if it was for sale at BoardGameGeekCon, but I was really trying to keep my purchases low, so I didn't even look for it, but maybe in the future I'll grab it. The fifth game I played is sort of an unofficial variant to Codenames. It was called the Codenames LARP, and LARP stands for Live Action Role Playing, which is kind of what this game was about. I went into it not really knowing anything. Uh, Paul Grogan had been talking about it for quite a bit on uh, Twitter. He works with CGE quite a bit, and he had this idea to do a convention-style game of Codenames. If you don't know how Codenames work, uh, simply put, there are 25 code words out on the table, and people try to figure out um, which words are what. Well, in this convention version, every single one of those code names, those cards, was given to a person. So there were 28 or so people playing, and I was one of those people. Uh, and the way it worked, it, we didn't really know until he just jumped in and he said it was going to be about 15 minutes, and it was, was we all had our code name in a, a badge around our neck, and we were told clues for the red and blue side, and we were all kind of collectively neutral. And we were trying to write down on a piece of paper who we thought was on the red side and who we thought was on the blue side based off of these kind of general clues. So in the original game, there are two different teams and there's one spy master giving clues just for their red team and one spy master just giving clues for their blue team. In this one, there were two spy masters, but they pretty much colluded together to come up with good clues and nobody really cared what team they were on. They just tried to figure out who was on which team. And at the end, they read out all the people who were in which spot and you got to count up your score. Um, I did very poorly. I only got nine out of the, I think, 16 uh, different uh, options right, which was definitely way below 50%, but it was fun because essentially we all just ran around. We were told a clue like um, Astronomy 2, and you're just running around looking at everybody's badges and, oh, you over there and you over there. It was much more memory-based because you see a badge and that person wanders off and everybody's trying to look at each other, but it was like 15 minutes and it was surprisingly fun. I didn't have the opportunity to play uh, the Codename Zarp again, even though he did it every single night at the convention, but I could see myself doing it again. It was a good time. The next game is Potion Explosion. This was one that was on my radar going into the convention, mostly because of the images that I'd seen online. It looked like this goofy game with a crazy gimmick, where you have this large cardboard contraption that you pour a bunch of different colored marbles into. They'll fall down into these little tracks, and all you do on your turn is pull marbles out. And gravity kind of slides the other marbles down, and if two marbles then collide and they're the same color, they explode, and you pull those out. And if that causes two more marbles to hit that are the same color, those explode, and you pull those out. So you're trying to create these chain reactions, and ultimately you're trying to take these different colored marbles and just put them onto little potions in a uh, just kind of order management system. You know, this potion needs three blue and two red. Well, you want to find a way to get those three blue and two red. 
on there. But the cool thing is once you create those expl those uh, potions, you put them to the side and you can drink them. Uh, every single potion can be drunk once in the game and it gives you a powerful effect that you can use to fill more potion orders. And the best part about it is you still get the victory points for that potion even though you drink it. So you're very... Um, uh, you're, you're motivated to drink all the potions you can, and they've got great art and a uh, great theme. It was fun saying, you know, I'm drinking the potion of the Abyssal Draft and all that kind of stuff. It was a good time. I ended up playing this one a couple times because just the visceral feel of pulling those marbles out and having them clack together and explode and pulling them out, and you might have a bum turn this time, but next time it comes around, you might end up with like 12 marbles in your hand, and you can't even do everything. Do um, You can't even do... Uh, everything you want with those, you're going to have to throw some of those back in the tray because it's more than you can even handle. And it's just a fun game. When it was on the table, I'd say at least five or six people each time we played walking by asked us what was going on there because it just looked interesting on the table. And I will say that it seemed like there was a bit of a runaway leader problem with the game. Both games, the person who won, won by quite a large margin, I think because as you successfully create these potions, they give you abilities which help you create more potions and then vice versa. You can kind of get a, um, a wheel really rolling in that respect. You're not building an engine because they're all one shots, but it still seemed like the rich got a little bit richer, but the whole game lasted about half an hour and even people who lost entirely seem to be really enjoying it. So I. I already looked into this one. It seems like it's pretty much sold out everywhere. There was uh, a little bit of a problem with the first printing run, I think, with the contraption. In fact, I bumped into that where it didn't quite work perfectly, but from what I've seen online, they've already, uh, they're already printing out a fix for it, and the next printing of the game will have all those fixes in it. So I could see myself owning this one in the future. It's just silly fun. The rules take like a minute to teach, and it was a good time. So now let's talk about Luna. This is not necessarily a new game. In fact, it was first printed about five years ago, but it just got a new printing. So it seemed like there was a bit of buzz about it at the convention, and I was able to uh, pick up a copy out of the library, and I wanted to play it. It's a older Steffenfeld game that I've heard a lot about. Many people have said online that this is one of his best uh, designs, and I just wanted to know what was going on in this game. I ended up playing it with Paul Grogan, who uh, bought it when it first came out many years ago, and he taught it to us, and we had a pretty good time with it, although I will admit it was a little bit more obtuse than I was expecting, especially from a Feld game. In this game, there is a large central um, cardboard tile, which is essentially a monastery, and then around that are a bunch of smaller islands, which are little uh, individual cardboard pieces that don't actually touch each other. And the main aspect of the game really is you have workers that are placed on all these different islands that are around this main central island. And in order to do a myriad of actions, you have to spend those workers and you'll get to reuse them on the following turn. But the fun thing is when you spend them, you pretty much always throw them into the ocean. It's like this kind of pagan thematic thing going on. It's like, oh, we need to uh, build a boat. Well, uh, Bob and Larry, go for a swim into the ocean. And by swimming in the ocean, maybe that makes a prayer or something like that, and a boat appears. Or maybe you get a tidal wave. Or maybe a phantom ghost-like helper appears, all from just jumping into the ocean. It's uh, definitely silly uh, thematically there. But the thing that, well... I enjoyed the game. I almost won. Paul beat me out by just a couple points, but it took many turns to figure out what I was actually trying to do. Uh, the basic idea is those people get used and they jump back on the island, and then you use them the next turn and they jump back on the different islands. But you can shift them all around to these different islands where you can get power-ups that let you do special things like getting those ships or um, getting those phantom people. But ultimately what you're trying to do is send these people into the monastery, which is in the center of the board, and it is just a bunch of hexagons with little numbers on them. Apparently, this mechanic was pretty much intentionally copied and put into La Granja, uh, which was a heavy euro that came out last year. And this part is, is quite combative. When you put a person in, it boots anybody out that was around that person that had a lower value to their hex. And so there's a lot of thinking. You have to see which person you want to put down on which spot and where it's going to go and what is it adjacent to. But then even just getting to that point, you need to jump these people off the ocean here and these people off the ocean here and maybe use this token to shift things around. And then there's also a little bit of area majority each turn. A new one of the outer islands is going to score points if you have the most stuff on it. And then another one of the islands is going to score you negative points if you have anybody there. And wow, there's just a lot to think about. And it, it definitely felt a bit convoluted trying to figure out how to get to that end point of getting uh, your acolytes into that monastery. You had to do this and then this and then this and then count this many islands around and then do that and do this. I, I could see myself playing it again because 
honestly, I feel like I've invested some brain power into figuring out how to get, play the game. So playing it a second time will be, I'll be able to jump into what I want to do more uh, rather than try to figure out how I do anything. But I, it did not really blow me away. I definitely prefer most other Stefan Feld games that I've played, mostly because it was so hard to figure out how to get from the beginning to the end and the process of just getting people into that monastery. And maybe this is because we were like four days in and this is like in the 16th or 17th hour of the day. But, but still, I could tell that it was a bit more convoluted than I wanted and uh, that was my experience with Luna. The second to last game I'm going to cover in this video is Chronicles Origins. Now this was a demo of a beta for the game. Uh, this game will not be coming out until sometime next year. I think there's going to be a Kickstarter at some point in February. But uh, the idea of this game, well first of all, it's being designed by Dirk Niemeyer who runs Artana Studios and they've made a whole bunch of games like Tesla vs. Edison and Tomorrow and um, uh, The New Science. Well, some of those were for, from a different publisher but still the same author and designer of the game. But in Chronicles Origins, Rob Davio is also helping with a legacy style aspect to the game. It's a really cool idea where you buy this box and you play the game several times and you, essentially you are in prehistory creating these um, hunter-gatherer tribes and trying to settle down a little bit. But once you play the game a few times, then apparently you could flip the game over, the game board over, and now you have a completely different game. And I believe you can take those custom tribes that you've created through other games and maybe fight against each other. I'm not positive about that. But what I do know is in the future, they're going to come out with more games, like entire boxes called Chronicles, I don't know, Roman Ages or something like that. And you, when you play that, the things that you did in the prior game, so in a whole other box, are going to affect how this new game works. So it's kind of like a new iterative level of legacy mechanic. In general, legacy means you're modifying this specific box, so every time you play it, it's gonna be slightly different. This one goes farther out, so the things you do in this game are going to branch out into other entire boxes of components and games that they said they're gonna be publishing for a bunch of years in the future. So that's neat, and we wanted to try a, a demo of it. So this um, Chronicles Origins, which is the very, very first thing you do, it's, like I said, a prehistory type thing, but really what it is, is a semi-cooperative game where you are all in the same village trying to build up this village. You're, you're building little buildings and you're exploring and you're um, be becoming smarter. <laughs> like uh, You get tags like you can be a savior or an explorer uh, specifically to your character. Uh, and the thing is, you can all collectively lose, but at the end of the game, if you don't collectively lose, then the person who has got the most victory points, I forget what the... the um, specific name for it was. It's a little token with a hand on it, so I kept high-fiving people with this hand token. Uh, the person who has the most of those wins, and they become the chief to the tribe. So you have the typical issues that uh, semi-cooperative games have, where you do want to collectively not tank the entire game, but you still want to win, and there is a blind bidding uh, process where you can give up resources to keep your um, engines going, uh, your engines for getting you different types of resources in the game. And if you're greedy, well, those engines are going to deplete down and not create much stuff, and then you might all collectively fail. The other thing I wasn't expecting about this game is it has a storytelling aspect to it. If you decide that you want to um, uh, forage in a spot, and so you can build a building, or you can just forage around and see what's going on, you could see, um, you get a story. Like, you literally get out a book and you say, okay, what's number 17? And then you read it. In one of these, I uh, founded a religion by looking out across the ocean and feeling moved by the waves, and, and I named a religion. And later on in that play session, I, I tried to become the savior of that religion through other mechanics. And so, story-wise, that was pretty cool. And it almost got to the point where we were motivated to do as much of the storytelling as we could instead of the uh, engine building stuff. So that's an interesting uh, balancing act that's going on there. Ultimately, we enjoyed it, but I will admit it felt pretty rough around the edges still. Now, this was a beta, so the game is far from done yet. Like I said, the Kickstarter is coming out in, I think they said February, but it just seemed like some of the mechanics were clunkier than they wanted, like the storytelling aspect and all that theme was very cool, but ultimately when you were just like building the buildings and doing the bidding process, it, that felt a bit dry and uh, not as interesting as I wanted. So I can't give a, a strong opinion on it because obviously it's not done yet, but it was an interesting demo. And the last game I'm going to talk about in this video is Dojo-kun. And it, since I said in the beginning I'm going to be covering games I liked and games I didn't like, 
This is the final one, and I did not enjoy this one very much. And that definitely surprised me. There was quite a bit of hype about this game coming out of Essen. In fact, many people said this was the hidden gem of the convention where no one was really talking about it going in. There was no hype for that, but there was quite a bit of rumblings where people said, oh, I played it, and then everybody around the table loved it so much, they all went out and bought a copy, and they all played it, and then other people bought copies, and I said, well, that sounds interesting. What's going on here? And I looked into it, and it did look cool. The idea of this game is it's three quarters a um, three quarters of the game is worker placement, and the last quarter is a um, a tournament, a martial arts tournament. So those first three quarters, you are building up your dojo, you're training your people, you're giving them special powers, you're getting new people, you're getting training equipment, you're focusing your chi. And then after you do uh, three turns of that, you all go to a tournament, you pit all of your people against each other in a bracket. You know, these people and these people and these people fight. Whoever wins, then these two people fight. And then whoever wins goes on to the grand finale. And after you do that, you reset it all back and you do another three turns of worker placement. And then a final tournament. So there are two tournaments in the game. What a cool idea, especially because the tournament it just involves throwing tons of dice. When you're in training your people, you're just adding dice to the people, and it's not that these dice are just uh, one through six pips. Now, they got all sorts of stuff going on them. They have holds and punches and kicks and jumps. They have uh, chi uh, symbols on them. There's just really cool stuff going on these custom dice, and I just really wanted to play it. And the biggest problem that I had with this game is I spent almost the entire game session with my nose in the rule book trying to figure out how to play the game. I read the whole rule book on the plane ride over to the convention, and I felt like I had a pretty good idea. But it seemed like every five minutes we had a rules question. Something just didn't quite work or something didn't make sense, and then it would take us ten minutes to find the answer in the rule book, and then we'd kind of keep playing, and then another five minutes we'd have another question, and then another ten minutes trying to find the answer in the rule book. It really killed the mood. The whole game took well over two hours for a three-player game, and I just did not have fun with it. I, I felt like there was too much going on, for what the payoff was. Now, I feel like if somebody had just taught this game for us and knew everything about it, I probably would have enjoyed it more, but I don't know if I would have ultimately liked it even so, because it just seemed like the worker placement part was okay. It was typical worker placement-y things. It was kind of cool focusing chi or um, learning special moves, but it still felt a little bit clunky because you have two different types of workers. You have your master and then you have your, your regular, you know, your athletes. You know, you specifically send them over here and they train which is kind of cool, but the master can only do certain things. And it seemed like if you want to get more people, you have to expand your dojo. And then once you expand your dojo, then you can get new people. But everybody only has one master, and all of these actions, specifically the expanding dojo action, can only take one master. And when there's only six worker placement uh, sessions for the entire game, and all three of us only get two shots of that thing, but they want to be going elsewhere to train their people, I get what they're saying is you can spend your whole game focusing on just a couple people and trying to have a couple really good fighters, or you could get a bunch of people, but all your fighters will be less good. But ultimately, it just kind of felt clicky and I didn't like it. Um, and the other big issue was that the tournament took forever, it seemed like. I love the idea of throwing all these dice and having a bracketed structure, fighting these people against these people and going up, and then these people fight and they go up. And the higher you go up in the rankings, the more victory points you get. But I mean, we're rolling the dice and counting, and all these symbols are so tiny. And then there is a hypothetically cool evaluation system where uh, the number of jumps you get negates the number of holds, and then the number of holds negates the number of uh, punches. Or there's three, different, three or four different types of things that go on there, and they all kind of negate each other, but what it ends up meaning is that each one of those fights takes like five minutes, and then you do, you do four of them down here, then you do two more, then you do a final one, and it seemed like that tournament just took forever. We were all collectively trying to count up all the little pips on the dice, it just felt fiddly, and I was expecting the tournament to be like a 10-minute process total, and it seemed like it was at least twice that. And honestly, it was also pretty fire and forget. There wasn't really any decisions to be made while you're playing that. Sure, occasionally you could activate a special power with the chi that you were able to get on those dice that you rolled and the chi that you had focused during the first part of the game, but it seemed very autoplay, like you just, if you got to that threshold, you did it. So this huge part of the game had pretty much no decisions in it, and it was fiddly and took a long time, and ultimately I felt like the entire game of Dojo-kun was just, it just, I think it needed some stuff chopped off the edges. It was too much, too convoluted, the rulebook was not great, and all three of us really did not have a good time playing it, and I, I don't anticipate playing this one ever again. 
All right, well, that finishes the first half to my post-Board Game Geek Con coverage. Uh, feel free to click the link to jump over to the next video and see 10 more games and all the different thoughts I have about them. Uh, if you'd like to see more stuff like this in the future, please subscribe to my channel, and you can also support my channel at patreon.com slash Games, and I'd really appreciate it. So thanks for watching.